I still remember how the screen door slammed that October morning. My foster father's voice, however, was even louder as he shouted after me, Just where the hell do you boys think you're going? I gestured over my shoulder at my friend Brett's car, idling at the end of the gravel driveway. I was going to a haunted house with some friends from school. I explained over the rumble in the motor. Over my dead body, Frank yelled. Get back up here! I couldn't understand what I'd done to make Frank Little so angry. He and my foster mo- Pam were a little rougher on the edges, but they weren't the exploiters or religious nutjobs that I'd feared when I was first put into the foster care. They'd been nothing but kind to me so far, although the look on my foster father's face suggested that that was all about to change. I wasn't scared of Frank Little, but I was afraid of what might happen if my new family rejected me. Giving up a haunted house seemed like a small price to pay to avoid the other kind of foster home. I shook my head at Brett. He rolled his eyes and drove off in a cloud of exhaust fumes, taking my hopes of fitting in at my new school with him. From now on, I'd be known as the loser who didn't celebrate Halloween. I dragged my feet on the way back to the porch, but all my irritation disappeared when I saw my foster father up close. He'd fallen, rather than sat, on the rocking chair beside the door. He was watching me with a self-shocked, pale expression of a man who'd just narrowly avoided a gruesome accident. You ever been to one of those things before? He asked. A haunted house, I mean. I shook my head. That was part of the reason why I was so eager to go. We got all kinds now. Ones with mechanical monsters, ones with people in masks, and jump out and grab you. At some of them, you gotta sign a waiver saying you're not responsible for whatever they do to you. you really sure you want to go to a place like that? I hadn't thought about it, but I doubted that the local spooky attraction in the small town where the Littles live was known for over-the-top horror. In fact, the bright orange flyer I'd found had said the place was kid-friendly. Frank rambled on. Of course, most places just put out those warnings for show. If they ever really did hurt anybody, they'd be out of business overnight, provided they were ever really in business to begin with. I mean, you never really know for sure who those masked figures are, do you? The ones who you've given permission to come out of the dark, touch you, maybe even drag you off someplace. Sure, it might just be an underpaid actor in a plastic costume, but can you really be sure? I'd heard rumors like that before campfire stories about serial killers and costumes who snuck into Halloween attractions to hunt their victims. I'd never paid them much attention, but the look on Frank's face made me reconsider. I'm not talking about a couple psychopaths here. What I want you to think about is this. Why do haunted houses exist? I shrugged. I didn't know where this bizarre conversation was going, and at this point, I wasn't sure I wanted to find out, but Frank wasn't done. I don't think I can't see the appeal. Of course, getting scared is sort of fun. Afterwards, you walk back out into the same ordinary world you left behind, but what if you don't? What if it's the houses that want people to go inside and not the other way around? I take a deep breath. So my foster father thought the buildings could have personalities. There were worse kinds of crazy to be, I reminded myself and looked wistfully down the country road where the fumes of Brett's car still lingered. This was my life now, and I'd have to make the best of it. I muttered an apology and moved towards the door, telling myself that I should count my blessings. But Frank's hand wrapped around my wrist like a claw. Look, I'm willing to bet that nothing would have happened if you boys had gone to that haunted house in town tonight. People visit haunted houses all the time, right? Nothing happens to them. Most of them. But if it did, would anyone notice the pattern? Think about it. If a cop or university professor suggested researching haunted house disappearances, they'd be laughed out of a job. So people look away and... And it keeps happening. Frank drank a swig of water like a man throwing back a shot. And for the first time, I wondered whether the water that he always carried with him was really a substitute for a different sort of bottle. 
Halloween wasn't always the big flashy holiday it is today. When I was your age, we had a few hay bales and pumpkins in front of the town hall, some cardboard witches in the windows of the elementary school. That, that was about it. If you wanted something fancy like a rubber mask or a costume party, you had to go to the big city, Frank sighed. I shouldn't have yelled at you, but when I saw your buddy pull up in his car, I thought back to the Halloween night when my two best friends and I took that drive. And I went to our first haunted house. Cassie and Tyler didn't have many friends. I didn't either. It may have been the only thing that the three of us had in common. But it was enough. Cassie's dad never did nothing but drink and cause trouble. Most folks figured the apple didn't fall far from the tree. Tyler, on the other hand, Frank blushed. Well, the only thing people had against him was the color of his mama's skin. It was different from his daddy's. The two of them had been dating for years, which is about as serious as it gets in high school. When they adopted me in a little group, I don't know why. Well, maybe they was just bored. Either way, with Tyler and Cassie, I finally started doing the sort of things I'd always imagined teenagers did. Smoking in the park, walking down railroad tracks, swimming in the river in summer, having plans for Halloween night. It's the worst part the part that stings. The haunted house was my idea. We had it all planned out. Tyler's mom was the editor of some magazine, and a grateful author had sent her some expensive liquor as a thank you gift. Tyler would steal the bottle, give it to Cassie, who would leave it out for her dad after school. By 6 p.m., he'd be blackout drunk. Cassie would snatch his keys, pick us up on the way out of town, go to the city where we'd, we'd trick or treat like little kids, visit a haunted house, try to sneak into some college parties. With the full moon rising and that fall wind in our hair, it felt like anything could happen. We had it all planned out. Frank repeated and shook his head. After buying some silly discount masks and gorging ourselves on candy bars from the rich neighborhoods, we headed for the haunted house. We hadn't kept track of time, and Cassie was afraid we wouldn't get there before close, not to mention the line. None of us were used to a city. We just... Finding a place to park amongst all those cars, it was a nightmare. It felt like the house, with its creepy lighting effects and soundtrack of evil laughter, was teasing us. Cassie left the car in front of a fire hydrant, and we took it off down the sidewalk, hoping we weren't too late. The ticket guy was a kid our age in zombie face paint, an oversized pinstripe purple suit told us the house closed at half an hour before midnight. We were there three minutes too late. All he wanted to do was finish cleaning up and go home, but I guess the look on our faces made him change his mind. He sighed, took our money, and pulled back the red velvet rope in front of the front porch stairs. The place had probably been some rich farmer's estate once. It was now gray, gaunt, and rickety. There was something hungry about the way it loomed over us as we walked inside. The double doors creaked, opened automatically. It was a nice touch, I thought. We walked into a hallway lit only by creepy blue bulbs. Tyler made a joke about what shows up in blacklight, and we all jumped a little and laughed when the door slammed shut behind us. <sighs> Must have been a pretty fancy house in its day. But the hallway Tyler, Cassie, and I walked down was bare except for plastic skeletons and fake cobwebs. It had a sad, barren look to it, like whoever had set up the haunted house didn't have the budget to decorate it the way they deserved. Halloween-themed songs played from a speaker somewhere and candles flickered in a couple jack-o'-lanterns, but that was about it. The three of us were pretty disappointed. We expected movie-quality effects, not cheap junk that we could have bought at the dollar store back in town. We'd almost reached the staircase at the far end of the hallway when a laughing woman with a rope around her neck fell from the ceiling. Now the rope brought her to a halt just above our heads, and we were all screamed. And up close, it was clear as day. We were looking at a mannequin dressed up like a witch, but that, that wasn't what startled me. See, I would have sworn that what I saw was Cassie eyeless, bone thin, like she'd been falling so long she starved to death. A Tyler gave the mannequin a shove and chuckled as it swung on its rope. Cassie shushed him. It didn't seem right, disturbing the silence like that. 
The echoes were all distorted like the hallway was somehow bigger than it looked. And I put my foot on the first step of the staircase. Everything went black. Suddenly I was falling. Not down these steps, but different ones. Steps so steep I could feel the wind around me. I tumbled through the dark. When I looked up, Cassie had caught me. There was no twisted stairs here, just the dim lobby of a cheap haunted house. I told the other two I'd race them to the second floor. We were panting by the time we got to the top. Even though it couldn't have taken that long, the theme up there was a classic monsters, a, a mummy that popped out from a broom closet, rubber bats bouncing from the ceiling, a mechanical zombie that sat up from its coffin. Nothing scary enough to even make us look twice, nothing like what had happened to me on the stairs. An arrow pointed in fake blood directions to a door on the left, and Tyler yanked the door open impatiently. We were bored already, eager to be done with this and worried about the car, but what we saw behind the door stopped us in our tracks. It was just an ordinary living room. No decorations, no cheesy themes, just a, just a gramophone, some armchairs, a ticking wall clock in the shape of a cat with big eyes that swung from side to side. It was a, a near-perfect replica of how how must have been people lived almost a century ago. Except that it looked brand new. There was even a cigar burning in the ashtray. A half-finished glass of brandy like whoever was living here would be back any minute. It felt obscene. Like we were invading someone's privacy. Trespassing somewhere we shouldn't. I was about to suggest that we turn back when the door slammed and locked behind us. I knew we had to cross that eerie room to leave it, but even so, it was... It was hard to take that first step. The tiny pink flowers on the hideous wallpaper seemed to squirm like tiny fingers, and I had an awful feeling that we were being watched from the far corner of the room. Suddenly, the gramophone started playing by itself, but the noise coming out of it wasn't music. It, it was us. Tyler and Cassie and I screaming, arguing, shouting in terror about bruises and grabbing hands. We'd, we'd never spoken those words in our lives. The three of us looked at each other and all had the same thought. Get out of here as quickly as possible. The gramophone kept getting louder and louder. I thought my ears would bleed before we got to the door on the other side of the room. But once we were through it, the noises stopped completely. And all the lights went out. We closed the door behind us and leaned against it, too scared to talk. Tyler started to say something about how... Maybe it was all part of the act, but the words died in his throat, especially after he looked around at where we were. It was a dim, dirty kitchen. If the room we'd left had been something out of the last century, this one was all 1970s. Dark wood cupboards, pea-green walls, puke-yellow linoleum. The only thing the two had in common was the inescapable, lingering feeling that we weren't supposed to be there like something was leading us into its trap, hunting us. Once when I was a kid, the basketball I was playing with rolled under a neighbor's porch. I crawled in after it without thinking, and as I was feeling around in the dank, cobwebby dark, something growled behind me. I never found out what it was. A stray dog, a mountain lion, maybe. Maybe just a rabid raccoon, but I never felt that kind of fear again until I stepped into that nasty little kitchen. Like I'd gotten myself trapped in a cramped place with something hungry and horrible. There were no windows and only one door. We had no choice but to keep going deeper into the house if that's what it was. There was something wrong about the air in here. It seemed to be moving in it. It wasn't until we approached the dripping faucet that I realized what it was. The air was buzzing with thousands of tiny flies. Cassie clamped a hand over her mouth and leaned over the sink to see what they was coming from. And then she groaned and bolted for the door. Tyler followed her, slipping in a puddle of something rust-colored and sticky that was coming from the fridge, and I followed. Our footsteps had woken the place up somehow. There was a bang from inside of the cabinets, then another so hard that they shook, and I realized I absolutely could not handle seeing whatever was about to come out of there. We shoved each other through the door just in time and felt it slam when something crashed into it behind us. 
More came hard enough to rattle the door on its hinges, but it held. We were in what looked like a children's nursery. Bright, wide, smiling zoo animals painted on the walls. Small bed topped with plain white sheets. A nightlight in the shape of a grinning plastic moon. It was dead silent. If the room was waiting for us, and then... All at once, four almost human shapes sat up beneath the covers. We froze, too scared to move. Then something reached out from beneath the bed and tried to pull me under. I yelped in pain, kicked it off, and ran. Once the door was pressed shut behind us, I rolled up the cuff of my jeans and found a burn mark in the shape of a tiny hand with too many fingers. It was painfully cold to the touch. Cassie started yelling, demanding to be let out, shouting that we'd never agree to let anyone touch us, but she stopped mid-sentence. It was the same argument we'd heard in the gramophone when we first walked into this nightmare. The realization shook us into silence. We finally began to take in our surroundings. We, we were in another hallway, but this one didn't have an end. The ugly yellow wallpaper and old-fashioned doors, they went on forever in both directions, just... Just looking at it made me want to grab onto the floor like at any minute the hallway would tilt and I'd slide down the carpet into the abyss. I was still trying to get my head around it when the door in of the room we'd left began to turn. There was rustling on the other side, fingers feeling around the gaps and hinges. Tyler started pulling on one doorknob after another, but they were all locked. At the pace he was moving, we struggled to keep up with him. He started knocking instead, swearing that he could hear movement and voices on the other side of the doors. He yelled and pleaded, begging to be let in, and then when Cassie and I were too far away to help him, he got his wish. The door in front of Tyler swung open and I saw the terror on his face for just a split second before he was sucked inside. The door shut and locked itself behind him, but Cassie and I weren't going to let that stop us. I kicked the door until my foot went through it, and then I howled in pain. There was nothing but a wall on the other side. It was like the house... The house had swallowed Tyler up. Even worse, we had no idea where we were. The doors were all identical. None of us had thought to mark the point that we'd started from. Cassie just shut down, holding her head in her hands and muttering about how this couldn't be happening. I remember thinking that at this rate it wouldn't be long before the both of us went crazy. And maybe that was the point. And then I heard the hinges creak. By the time I spun around, the door was wide open. There was nothing but darkness on the other side. So that's what I thought at first. Once I got closer, though, I saw the stairs, narrow, uneven, with a plunge into the blackness on either side and no guardrail. Did I ever mention that I'm scared of heights? I couldn't do it. I told Cassie I'd starve to death in the endless hallway before I'd make myself climb down there, but she wouldn't take no for an answer. Through a mix of pleading insults and holding my hand, she finally got me moving, even though I had, I had to crawl backwards to do it. Those steep, jagged steps were made of something slick and cold as ice. A black wind blew around us as we crawled downwards. It felt like being on the edge of a mountain peak, even though I knew that was impossible. We were still indoors, weren't we? And maybe, on the other hand, we hadn't been in that cheap, haunted house for a long time. Just maybe we'd been swallowed by someplace else. Before long, the stairs were so tall and narrow, it was almost like being on a ladder above empty space. I was so tense, I started shaking. I guess it's no surprise that I slipped. I slid downward, unable to grip the narrow steps, knowing that at any second I might fall into the nothingness on either side. Cassie caught me. It happened exactly as I'd envisioned it earlier that night, just like the, the yelling we'd heard on the gramophone. So what about the mannequin? The one that had looked like Cassie's long, dead, falling through empty space, clinging to almost 
vertical steps, I shouted my friend's name, and even though I knew that it was already too late, by grabbing me she'd unbalanced herself and gone over the edge, she probably... She probably didn't even have time to scream. Cassie had been so sure the stairs were our way out, but what if they had been a trap all along? After all, we'd opened the door to the darkness the house had. I climbed back up the stairs as quickly as I dared and found the hallway above exactly as I'd left it. Not exactly. There, there was an end to it on either side, and there were sounds. Cars driving by outside, the hum of a heating system, and the teenager who'd taken our tickets yelling about how I wasn't supposed to be back there, and how the haunted house was closed. Of course, I filed a police report. A lot of good that did. When I told them what happened, they decided my friends and I were junkies on a bad trip. Later, they kicked around the idea that we were in some kind of satanic cult, and that I killed them myself. In the end, I guess they just decided that the whole thing was too complicated and strange to bother with. Tyler's family moved away without a word to anyone. Cassie's dad drank himself to death before Christmas. The neighbors said that at night, he would scream out her name like he didn't know she was gone. I stayed where I was and did my best to forget about the whole thing. As you can see, it hasn't worked out. The sun had set while Frank had told me his story. And in the twilight gloom, he looked almost like a ghost himself. I didn't know what to say. I mumbled something about how it was getting cold on the porch and headed for the screen door. I'm not asking you to believe everything you hear, Frank smiled. Just promise me that as long as you live under my roof, you'll stay away from haunted houses. I nodded and Frank pulled himself up from his rocking chair to follow me inside for supper. That's when I noticed the scar in his ankle. A scar in the shape of a small, six-fingered hand. Fall is finally here, and it's finally cooling down, which means it's time for you guys to get yourself a hot cup of tea. My wife happens to sell tea. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea sells different teas that are inspired by nerdy-based things, as well as a bunch of new teas that are available for the Halloween season. My personal favorite, and the one that I drink whenever I'm recording, is Dark and Stormy Night. It has a little Mr. Creepypasta symbol on it, and if you ask, you can get a little Mr. Creepypasta dabbing sticker. Also, anytime that you order one of those, you actually get my autograph on a little card, so if you want that, hey, you can get that. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Krause, Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.